Hello. I already got a nice introduction, but I just want to emphasize I am a professor in the Department of Design here at Cal State Long Beach. Go Beach. Yeah, go Beach. I used to play a lot of video games. And one of the reasons for that is that I used to make video games. So I would spend long days playing and making video games. Um, about 20 some odd years ago, I noticed something significant was changing in the field. And I was running a studio in Chicago. We made and played games mostly based on two-dimensional graphics. But back in that time, in the late 1990s, games were becoming architectural. So instead of designing graphics, we were designing spaces. We used materials, we used lighting, we designed structures, we navigated through space. And one thing that became clear to me, first of all, that something very significant was happening. But the other thing that became clear to me is I didn't have those skills. So I did what I needed to do, I closed my business, I sold my home, I loaded up the truck, and I moved to Los Angeles. I enrolled in the Southern California Institute of Architecture to get a master's degree in architecture. I was hoping that I would be able to develop some of those skills that I was lacking, but also to kind of understand the impact that architecture was beginning to have on digital spaces and on games. By the time that I graduated, I realized that that was not the significant question. The significant question was, what impact are digital spaces having on architecture? And I found out that that impact is quite significant. So in fact, and this is already early 2000s, before the iPhone, we were becoming increasingly immersed in digital spaces. And as we became immersed in those spaces, we kind of shut out the world around us. So digital media tends to draw you into its own space. My interest was in bringing digital media back into physical space. But I learned something else. And the other thing that I learned is that when you were immersed in digital spaces, the blurring of fact and fiction becomes quite a problem. It becomes exceedingly difficult to tell the difference between the real and the fabricated. So I want to give an earlier example because there are very, very old techniques that do this. One of these is a painting technique called trompe l'oeil. You've probably heard of it. Trompe l'oeil, it's from the French word trompe, to trick or to deceive and l'oeil, which is the eye. So trompe l'oeil literally means trick of the eye or an optical illusion. You find these as far back as frescoes in Pompeii. You find them in medieval cathedrals. You find it where architectural features are painted onto a flat wall. Sometimes it's a window, right? It's just a flat wall, but you paint a window on it. And as long as you include some of the architectural details of the space that you're in, the spaces get blended. So we, we kind of develop this ability to develop and to understand um, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional spaces and to meld them together. There are some contemporary media examples of this. In the early days of radio, for example, when the announcer who was reading the news was also the one who was reading the commercial messages. And what does that do? It's a form of trompe l'oeil because the news, the information, and the commercial messages are coming through the same authoritative voice of the same announcer. So in our minds, we blend them together and it becomes more and more difficult to tell them apart. So this technique is also found in reality television, right? Isn't reality television all about the blending of fact and fiction? So we've kind of adjusted our lives to these digital spaces in which the difference between fact and fiction becomes quite blurred and we reach a point where we can't tell them apart anymore. Oh, another example of this, for example, why do we elect so many actors and reality stars to elected office? Because we blend the fictional character, the qualities of the fictional character with the real person. They become one and the same. So when you mix fact and fiction into the same space, you can't tell them apart. <clears throat> a short while ago, a student came into my office seeking advice on a business plan. And I said, okay, so what makes your business competitive? He said, customer service. I said, okay. He said, do you know what Gandhi had to say about customer service? I said, Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi? Uh, no, what did Gandhi say about customer service? A customer 
is the most important person on our premises. We are not dependent upon him. We are dependent upon him. He is not dependent upon us. And on and on. And, and finally, I asked, why do you think that Gandhi had anything at all to say about customer service? Was he like a owner of a big box chain of stores before he became a lawyer and an activist and liberator of his people? I was really surprised by the lack of skepticism. So I asked him, where did you find this quote? The internet. As if the internet were this single authoritative source of information. So we did a little bit of research, we hunted it down. You can do this yourself, by the way, it's a lot of fun. So use the keywords, Gandhi, customer service, and you'll find what we found, which is countless hits of this exact same quote. And some of them are even famous head memes. You know what a famous head meme is? It's one of those memes where there's a picture of a famous person or somebody you like with a quote attached to it. I hate to tell you this, most of the time, they're not true. They're false. They're made up. Now, this seems like a trivial example, like, so what? So what if Gandhi didn't say this thing about customer service? But let me put it in a different light. If I can get you to believe that somebody that you admire and trust supports my agenda, maybe I can get you to support my agenda. So when you look at these memes now as tools of manipulation, they are no longer so innocuous. So let's fast forward 15 years. COVID hits. We're forced into physical isolation from each other. Fortunately for us, technology has kept up. Our technologies have scaled to the point where digital media streams into our homes. We use Zoom to go to work, to go to school, to visit with family, to go on dates even. We watched Netflix and we chilled. <laughs> we ordered food from Grubhub, Postmates, and Instacart. But what really happened is that we were plunged into the surreal landscape in which all of our interactions with the world were coming through the same place. We're coming through this, these screens, most of which were either on our desk or in our pockets. I don't call this a phone anymore, it's my pocket inf information appliance. So, and it all comes, and, and the internet becomes this meat grinder of news, entertainment, social interaction, commerce, and it all gets ground into this indistinguishable goo that comes out of the same faucet. Is it any wonder that belief in conspiracy theories is at all-time highs? And so, <laughs> this is really kind of a serious problem. And in fact, it is so serious. You know, the Gandhi case is, yeah, all right, whatever. Gandhi didn't really say that, who cares? A lone gunman walked into a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. with a gun looking for the children that were captive in the basement who, of course, weren't there because he believed the conspiracy theories that were fed to him on the Internet, that sole authoritative source of information. In more recent news, quite recent, in the news still recent, one of our highest government officials, the spouse of one of our highest government officials, was viciously attacked in their own home. And to make matters worse and add insult to injury, the conspiracy theories about the very attack circulated as quickly as the news about the attack itself. So some of these consequences are actually quite dire, and we have to take them seriously. And I know I'm not the first person to tell you about this. The Pew Research Center discovered that 70% of Americans are more worried about social collapse due to information disorder then they are worried about climate change. In fact, the Aspen Institute, they formed a commission on what they call information disorder. I like that expression, information disorder. The conclusion of the report was that we are in a crisis of trust and truth. It is a crisis so serious that it demands urgent attention from every part of society. The Rand Corporation calls their studies truth decay. I think that's cute, I like that. Truth decay, politicians call it fake news, alternative facts. S comedians say truthiness. We're all very, very familiar with this problem. We're all very, very familiar with the fact that it's getting much, much more difficult to tell truth from fiction. And then when you add things like deep fakes, artificial intelligence, and you're looking at all of this on the same screen, 
and you can no longer tell the difference? What happens when you can't tell the difference anymore between what's true and what's not true? Do they become the same? That's when you become lost. And we are lost. That's when, that's when you are navigating the unknown because we don't know anymore. How do we get here? So let's talk about how we know things. How do we know things about the world? Well, first, the only things we know are what we can see, what we can touch, what we can hear, our direct experience. Everything else we know about the world comes from other people. Right? We share stories. We write books. We make movies. We record and broadcast our voices. And we build a community of knowledge. Right? And without that community of knowledge and without trust in the experience of other people, we're nowhere. How can we plant a rover on another planet? And today, you can look on your phone and you can see pictures from the Mars rover because the scientific community worked together and they built a body of knowledge and we trust that knowledge and we trust it in that knowledge. The James Webb Space Telescope allows us to see the outer reaches of the universe. This is miraculous because we trust in our institutions. If you want to destroy a culture, destroy trust in its institutions. You know, let's test this hypothesis. I want to share a belief I have. I say that the world, the earth, is flat. And it is. The earth is flat. Look around you. I can step, I'm not allowed to step over there, but step over here, step over there. Everywhere you step, flatness. Go out to the coast, you see nothing but flatness. You see the horizon, just flat, all flat. Actually, I see some hills over there and some mountains, so maybe it's not flat, let's call it bumpy. So the, the earth is bumpy, and that's my assertion, and that's what I believe. But yet, at the same time, there's some people, actually a lot of people, most people are telling me that it's not true. They tell me that the earth is a sphere, huge sphere, and it's in space, and it's traveling through space at thousands of miles per hour. Now, that kind of sounds crazy, right? So it, it certainly runs counter to everything I see in front of me. So in order for me to believe that the Earth is a sphere hurtling through space at thousands of miles per hour, I have to have trust. I have to have trust in the institutions that have built the common knowledge that taught me this. And as soon as that trust is eroded, I'm lost. I know nothing besides what I ate for breakfast, and what I can see outside my window. We only achieve greatness when we have trust in each other and in our institutions. Now this is the part of the talk where I'm supposed to offer solutions and we're all gonna walk away feeling good. Sorry. <laughs> I, I really can't. I mean, honestly, this is a really serious problem. And, and it, it's multifaceted. There are a lot of very, very smart people studying this, though. I'm happy to say there are academic institutions and research institutes that are putting this problem front and center, as I think we all need to. We all need to put this front and center. So what do we do about it? On the one hand, you want trust. On the other hand, we know that Russian troll farms, you know, are, are creating fake social media accounts and spewing this toxic sludge of information at us every single day and we can't tell the difference. At the same time, and this is one of the other conclusions of the Aspen Institute, in a free society, there are no arbiters of the truth. And I thought that was an extremely powerful statement. It's true. We value free speech. We value the voice of dissent. We value the voice of the oppressed. And if we're gonna build a collective knowledge, if we're gonna build a culture and a society based on collective knowledge, we need to preserve that value. But at the same time, you know, we've got malicious actors who are infecting our information streams with bad data. So at the time being, because I, I'm not in favor of the, you know, the hammer approach here, in the time being, the best thing that we can do is educate ourselves. In the 21st century, when students get more information from YouTube and TikTok than they do from textbooks, in the 21st century, media literacy is literacy. And we need to be teaching it from the time we put a tablet in front of a child, from the time we put them in front of a television screen. 
It needs to be part of our curriculum at every level of education. The paradox here is I'm telling you, you need to trust. We need to trust in order to build great things, in order to inspire ourselves, in order to stand on the shoulders of giants so that we can see further. But at the same time, I'm telling you to be skeptical. Don't trust. Validate. Look everything up. Find primary sources. Check that URL. Check that fake media account. Check that news site. That takes a lot of work. Are you going to do it? If you don't, we're lost. So I'd kind of like to close with one of my favorite quotes from the first century Roman philosopher, Seneca. I think he wrote this in 58 AD. The internet is a great fountain of knowledge into which fools urinate daily. <laughs> Drinketh from it at thine own risk. Thank you very much. <laughs>